insightful word from um, WA and grower. Uh, you, you talk about you talk about opportunities for young people to come into agriculture. I mean, as I see it now, if if I step away from the farm, there are limited opportunities for me, regardless of my skill. How do you suggest we attract people to the industry uh, if there aren't the roles there for them? Yeah, I might give a quick answer and pass along to my, to my guests today. So um, it comes back to branding. The, the Australian farmer, and, and absolutely no disrespect to a, a drought-stricken Queenslander, when you do your anal analysis and market insights and your foresight work, the average Australian consumer believes the farmer is a 65-year-old with a cowboy hat, red dirt and, and suffering animals. Now, whenever I, and I've just been on a three-week roadshow around Australia, and I have mothers farming, vibrant farming, entrepreneurial families, and mothers come up to me and go, please change the brand perception of what city folks see as Australian farmers. They need to see lively, vibrant, healthy families living in the most beautiful regional rural communities of Australia with parity with their city folks on wage and health care, et cetera, et cetera. National Farmers Federation, we need to reframe our brand. We need to change the perception of Australian farming, big time, because if we don't, I, and I just put my, I just want a show of hands here. I was, I was actually gonna, gonna do this, but I, I usually do it at all the, the members' councils I speak at. Who here um, would encourage, uh, who here has children would encourage their child to go into agriculture? Brilliant. That's about triple what, what, uh, what it, what it uh, usually is. Now, I actually speak a lot of universities and I actually say, um, if, if livelihood, lifestyle, vibrant communities, connecting with friends is the way to go, go be a farmer in regional rural Australia and use technology. Because I can guarantee um, what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years will be unprecedented. There is no pillar of the Australian economy, and this is what frustrates me about the lack of foresight work going back into agricultural production. There, there is no pillar of the Australian economy that can double by 2030, except agriculture. And I'd challenge anyone over a drink later to argue that with me, but we sit here today needing to make the right investments, capital, infrastructure, productivity, brand, new generation, Otherwise, the children in primary schools of today won't be farmers in 2030 and won't, we won't realise that dream. I might now um, hand across to Peter because I think there's, a, there's an interesting thread around farm size and, and youth. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Peter, but I've got a hypothesis that bigger, more productive, innovative farms may actually have a, have a youth bias. Yeah, like I haven't got those tabulations in front of me, but my, my guess is that it goes hand in hand with the information we have around debt. So the majority of the debt is taken on by um, businesses that are growing, the larger end of the scale, and usually by uh, younger farmers. So I would guess that um, you know it would follow that the the people running the innovative businesses are the are the younger the younger set. And I mean that that makes perfect sense when you think about the set of skills that are required now. It's becoming um, you know more technological. Um, it's, you know, people um, having to think more carefully about marketing strategies and other things, as well as the, the equipment you're using to, to sow and harvest. So, um, I mean, I think, I think you're right that one, one, of the, one of the selling points for agriculture that hasn't, that hasn't been used so much is the, the technology side of it and how that's changing and that there are, you know, exciting things to do with new technology in agriculture. And uh, Graham, um, what's the like, sorry, what's the demographics like on your uh, your client base? Yeah, look in the um, in that top twenty five percent group. Um, those studies we did of it, there was a very very clear trend that all of those guys had started their management role um, at about under somewhere under twenty five, but had some level of management experience before they were twenty five, and often as young as um, sixteen seventeen. So mum and dad were involving them in the. Uh, in the planning meetings, the strategy meetings. So these guys were, were really well indoctrinated into how to run a business, not just to run a, a farm and look after a few sheep. It's basically how to run a business and try and extract the best out of that. So, so that's one thing that was really clear. Um, the other thing we see is where some of these guys are, are now older and they're getting through you know, their career, they've always got someone young, in that, well, not always, but very close to always, in that top 25 group, there's someone young coming through the business that's really starting to drive it. So someone who's really starting to push along and push Dad's thinking, and Dad's you know, really been receptive to that. And I think you could nearly say that's almost 
without exception in that top 25% group. So there's some fascinating things in there. Just on your branding thing, I agree with you. Um, one of the things that we as a business have been really keen to do is to try and get some positive messages out about farming because there's, um, there's a really positive story to go and sell there. And uh, it's a great industry, it's got a great future. And, um, and you don't have to be a landowner to be involved in agriculture. There's, um, you know, there's plenty of the service and other related industries that can provide great careers and give great returns as well. So you know, I'm sure we have less farmers, but there's a lot of other people that they need to support them. So. Yeah, look, I think it's a great future. Mm. Other questions? Oh, sorry. I think, that, back to your question, I, I think we've got to change the banking model. I've, I've had this discussion with a couple of banks. For young people, agriculture's becoming like royalty. You either marry in or you're born in. And that's, that's got to change. And I think the banks have got to look at different, you've got to be different models for different age groups. And not, not just low interest loans, it's got to be a completely different model. And the risks, you know, the problem with a young bloke, if he wants to step up and have a go at 22, he's got to carry the, all the risk. And they won't give him the money unless he's got a deposit anyway. Unless mum and dad or someone back it up. So it, something's got to change. Whether it's banks, investment, foreign investment, who knows what it is. But we have to have a different model to what we have now. That's a great segue, uh, Sasha, please. Any comment there? Uh, well, I when I was kind of listening to the question, writing down various different comments, I put um, technology, um, sustainability, because there is a correlation between um, the young people caring about natural capital in a more significant way across the board. Also, um, multi-generational farms, you also see a strong residence with natural capital, those that are involved in succession planning. I put community, and I put capital. So, I mean, I think that we need to have a discussion around different capital models and, and other kinds of financing arrangements. Just one other stat. Tom Quigley, he's the, one of these guys in France. He's a cotton grower from Narrowmore. And 72% of French citizens felt close to farmers. That we wouldn't even be at 5% in Australia, maybe 10, who knows. And 69% had a good opinion on ag. The first taxi I saw said ban the live export trade. Ask Luke Bowen what that did to the Northern Territory. We've got it wrong here. And, and that comes squarely on the shoulders of the National Farmers Federation, I might add, to uh, change the brand. If we can't show leadership, if we can't connect the 400,000 Australians who are either farmers, farm employees or agribusiness professionals, if we can't unify them, if we can't have a common voice around sustainability, animal welfare and branding, then who else is? So we, we've, got, we've got a plan in place that uh, I'll have a chat with you later about, um, but, but fundamentally things have to change. Uh, next, next question, please. Over here. Um, Helen Thomas, a uh, farmer from South Australia. Um, I think we also need some kind of training scheme, a sort of a, a group apprentice scheme. We have a lot of farmers out there. We're in a position where we would like to take someone on probably half time. We probably ended up working these longer hours until we could get to the point where we can take someone else on now full time. It's a, a really big jump to get to that another full time employee. So we end up using a lot of contractors, a lot of casuals. Um, if there was a, a sort of a, a system where you could share someone bright and upcoming and where they had a career path, you know, like um, we have four children, probably they'll want to become involved in a, a management capacity, but the first two have already got engineering uh, degrees and want to work part time in the farm while they're still pursuing their other interests. Um, do we have a system where we can provide a career path for someone so that, you know, we have a couple of kids in mind around the district whose parents were, no way can you be a farmer, you go and get an apprenticeship, you become a plumber or whatever. So you've got um, a trade, you've got a qualification behind you. Look, it's an excellent question and, um, you know, two farmers, three opinions, four committees and... Um a whole bunch of training and innovation products sit behind those. So the point I'm trying to make is we, we do lack a national voice, we do lack structure, and we tend to have bits and pieces, and it's like looking at a spaghetti bowl, where there's some gems at the bottom, but you, you try, can't work out how to actually affect practical change at a farm level, and that's the red tape scenario as well. Um, I, I might actually hand across to, to David and Sasha here, because I, I think there's something interesting in, in farm leadership, and, and, and David spoke about um, uh, four or five employees, but there's also, for me, uh, foreign investment. So that we need the banks to take some leadership, um, both domestic and international banks, around 
share structures, equity structures, co-farming, equity builds from young farmers. So they can see coming in early with minimum capital, but they can see a 5, 10, 15 year vision where they can make themselves relatively wealthy. Unfortunately, again, the Kiwis get it. Um, they have those structures in place, particularly in dairy, and they've got amazing success stories. Um, David, any thoughts on that? Oh, no, Nani, there's some terrific, there's some people who do this really well in this country already. Um, could have been in the room, some of them with equity partners or whatever else, and maybe even a mentoring program for people like we, or well, we've got to turn up in Ferraris at farm meetings, not Land Cruiser Utes. Got to make it sexy. If you want to get the young fellas in and get them rolling in, you've got to, and I stole that Ferrari thing from West Australia too, that's a bit sad. Um, <laughs> he, was, he was talking about it yesterday or the day before, but I think it's, um, you know, we've got to, we've just got to upbeat it, you know? And, and, he, and you've got to keep trying. I guess what's distracting us where we are right now is that we spend more time fighting with our local government than we do, in, not when it's our local government, just about policy things that are happening. And you, and you lose focus, I guess. So you need someone to keep the focus going all the time. Sasha? Well, I think that the question was around um, training um, and apprentice schemes and, and, and how do you build that, that broader um, sense of, of community, but also um, skill sets and, and career pathways. Um, and and I, I mean, I think that that's really critical. It's, it's absolutely fundamental. Your particular question was around capital um, or your comment. Uh, and I mean, I, I think that we need a range of different capital arrangements and structures. There's a role for debt. There's a role for equity. Uh, we need different kinds of structures to meet increasing needs. Of, of investment in, in agriculture in Australia. Uh, Graham, I might, you've got a good client base here. Yeah, look, um, one of the things that we see is we, we do very much see the, the children coming through the family farm model. And I can only think of one example, one really good successful example in Western Australia where a non-farmer has actually gone farming and made it work really, really well and done it you know, with a reasonable capital base, admittedly, to help them. But, um, but it's something that if we had a system that has structure around that, and really by saying that we don't, um, because I think it's a fairly well recognised problem, but one that we don't have a solution to yet, and we should be developing one here. Yeah. And one lucky last question before we break. Yes, been here a while. Um, my question is to uh, Peter Gooday. Um, the farm numbers ca um, consist of quite a substantial number of farms that by any sense of the imagination are not really serious producers. Uh, your data now show that the proportion of those is increasing and so I'm just wondering whether you've ever done an analysis that shows uh, how much distortion uh, that puts on, on what real agriculture is about. Yeah, okay, so, so our numbers, the ones I showed today are, are a bit different than the ABS numbers, so they're based on our survey, so it only includes people who we think are um, actual farmers, but, um, you know, the evidence I showed is that um, there are more and more people, well, a greater proportion of the farm population is now down at that, that bottom end where their focus may not be on the same set of things that the top end are on, and while we haven't done any, um, you know, the only analysis we've done is the, I suppose the sort of thing that, that um, Graham was showing where you look at the top 25% versus the others and, and the same sorts of thing. Um, but I suppose my point was more and more now we're going to have to rely on making that distinction when we're presenting, um, when we're presenting statistics to be used in you know, policy making or industry decision making or um, setting R&D priorities because there probably is a difference between what the two groups want and the policies you're going to have to use to satisfy both of those are probably going to be quite different in some cases. Simon, well, can I just make one comment on that? No, I, agree. The, um, I reckon we should, because I think it's a significant it's a very good question and it's a good point. I, it's like a footy team or a footy club. You've got first, second and third grade. And I think we should start reporting first, second and third grade. And fourth grade might not survive. And that's probably another issue that I think shows up on these numbers every time. And I think Don McGecky mentioned it some other, uh, the Rabo F20 
conference. That we, we've got to fix up the tail. You know, the tail's got to go. If we want, you want the industry to thrive, you've got things that have got to drop off the bottom, bottom end. So I think it should be reported differently. Great, great point to, to finish on there, David, because we, we do over-index in the bottom 20 and we, we create the perception of whinging farmers. We need to over-index in the top 20 entrepreneurial, vibrant farming families in, in regional rural Australia. I'd uh, just like to thank our guests, Peter, Graham, Sasha and David, and uh, thank you for your participation. <laughs>